Hi, and welcome to the first G. Franco Online Congress. My name is Billy Fajardo, and I'm basically just going to talk about competition. A lot of different things I like to, to uh, cover, but let's start by category. Which category should I pick? Okay, I'm going to give you my experience. I know for a fact that if I went over to a competition and I took a look and I got excited about being a soloist or doing the same gender, being on a team, competing in cabaret, competing on the on one, the on two, whatever that is, right? I'm pretty sure that I'm going to first evaluate my skill set. If I think about soloists, I think about fast twitch, really fast kids that are, that are, that, that, that are doing shines at a speed in which I probably can't do. Okay, so that's probably one evaluation I'll do right quick. I'm not going to be a soloist. All right. So I know that when I was younger and I did a lot of tricks, a lot of dips and drops. So I decided to compete in cabaret. And that was how I came about it. It was a natural process. I said, okay, well, I do a lot of dancing where I do a lot of lifting and stuff like that. Okay, this seems like a category I can do. So that's one of the things is I always find people at the summit or any competition that I go to. I watch people enter categories in which I say to myself, why would they enter that category? You know, this, this doesn't seem to be the category that they have a shot at winning or placing. You know, I find them to be a bad choice. So my suggestion to you is evaluate and pick the proper category for you. Now that you've picked the right category, another big step, rules and regulations. I can't tell you how many times I have to go as a head judge to some competitor at my event or someone else's event and have to tell them that it's a qualified lost points. And that's all due to not reading the rules and regulations. Guess what? Every competition has different rules and regs. There's only a few of them that have the same. So let's go with the assumption that you have to go to every different event and every event you go to, you have to read the rules and regulations. That's important. The on one and the on two basically have the rules in the same. And most of them go by the three trick rule, okay? But then you have some that has five sets of tricks, okay, you're allowed to do. You have to check which ones they are. I'm not gonna point out the competition exactly, but I will say that you're, it's your job to talk about rules, to understand the rules and regulations whenever you compete. That's a really important thing. Cabaret, we know that you're entitled to as many lifts as you want, but there has to be content like how much salsa or bachata you actually have to do in a cabaret. Some events say 80%, some events say 60%. That's another reason why you're gonna to have to go and check the rules and regs. You have to know the differences between a classic routine, okay, and a cabaret. They use those words, okay? Open category means that everything can be used in terms of status. So watch this. You get a team that comes out and they compete in open, but then you watch that same team compete in pro-am. But then in the open category, you'll have someone that comes from the pro or rising star competing open, because open means everyone can compete in that particular category. Those are in the rules and regs. That's just an example. There's so many different examples. Same gender, okay? You have to look at those rules. Um, so my suggestion, Read every single rule in the competition. Understand them. It'll make you a better competitor. So let's talk about music. I'm actually talking about not how to use the music competitively. I'm talking about the practical things like handing in your music to an event. A lot of events today have uh, online, they email it, and they have your music. So the first thing you got to find out is that you have to sign your name to it um, and the length of time of your music. Um, that's usually what they ask for. Remember, check the rules. If the rules say that you can have your music anywhere between one minute and two and a half minutes, make sure it doesn't go for like 231. You understand? Try to keep it within that time limit so you don't have any issues with that. Always have several copies of it in the format in which they need it because every event has different formats. You understand? So we have to adhere to the competition that you're attending and have the music prepared for that. I can't tell you how many times people go and I watch this and it makes me so sad when I watch someone get on the floor, they're excited, they do their routine and 30 seconds in the music goes. And then me as a head judge or me as a judge or a promoter, the first thing that comes to my mind 
is I wonder if they gave the music incorrectly or did they check the music with the DJ or did they DJ mess it up? So it is, is it the promoter's responsibility? Whatever happens, if you give in your music, my suggestion to you is if you do an email, when you get to the event, check and see if they have your music. And then after that, listen to your music on your headphones with the DJ to make sure that you have it there. That way there's no mistake that you did your part in having your music there completed. That's a really important thing. Okay, so remember, to the music within the time frame they gave you, double check and make sure the DJ has the music in the format that you gave, and listen to the music to make sure that they know, that you know, that you handed it in correctly. So now I'm on a subject that really, really matters a great deal to me. Um, how do we prepare for a competition? Rehearsal. Back in the studio is where you do it all. My suggestion is easy. You have to rehearse a routine enough times so then it's second nature. You can't be thinking on the dance floor. That's just your enemy. You have to be able to dance naturally, second, it's got to feel. Matter of fact, one of the things that I noticed in my life whenever I competed and I'm well rehearsed is that when I finished the routine, I always looked at my partner and said, it's over. Well, wow, that was so fast because you don't really feel that. It, the time goes by so quickly. And that's the kind of experience I want you to have. You stay home and you go to that rehearsal and you rehearse this thing 7,500 times. Make sure that you do it so many times that it's second nature. It has to feel that way for you to have a great performance. Because once you take the physicality out of it, then you can perform it. That's really important. Okay, because in competition, everything is about performing it at the highest level. So rehearsal, preparation, I say 75, 100 times. If you do it more, great. Run it back to back too. Another mistake that a lot of people make is that they'll go into a rehearsal and they'll split up the choreography. They'll do a third of it here. They'll do another third of it there. Maybe they'll do the tricks up here, the turn patterns there, the shines here. And they never really run the whole routine a lot. And then time goes by and then you're a month away and you say to yourself, wow, you know, we got to really rehearse this. And then you get stressed. And all. From the very beginning that you establish what that choreography is going to be, you should be able to run that and run it back to back as often as you can. I'll give you a little tip. When I'm home and I have my couples and I train them, they already know that when they come in, they better be warmed up and they gotta hit a goal. And the goal is to run it 10 or 15 times back to back before they go to the competition. That's a prerequisite. I make them do that. I want my couples to be at the highest level when they go and enjoy that process. Remember, you always want to enjoy competition. It has to, at some point, be fun. And one of the sad things that I witness every year, it doesn't fail. Always a couple or a small young man or a small child goes out and competes and they have costume malfunctions. Costumes that don't fit them, costumes that fall apart. You know, a string comes off of here, a belt flies over there, the shoe falls off. All of these things, and a lot of these things can be dealt with at rehearsal. When you get the costume done, you have to go to rehearsal and you have to run your routine, not one time, run it several times. Because every time you run the routine, something different is going to happen, or it might happen. That's what you want. How does that costume deal with all the situations you're putting it under? Sometimes costumes don't are not even good for that particular competition or that particular routine you're doing because it's not practical. I know for a fact that if when I do choreography for, for my couples and they come to me always with costume ideas and I says, yeah, but you're doing this trick here that if you have anything on that sleeve, it's going to make it impossible to do this trick correctly. Or if you have a sleeve where you don't supposed to have it and I do a trick where I'm grabbing the wrist and all of a sudden that fabric pulls, I can think of a million things that can go wrong. So you avoid that by getting the costume done beforehand, like 
a good two or three weeks before the competition. Don't wait for the last minute. That's another thing I see. People actually fixing their competition, their, their competition costume on site. Like, why would you do that? Be prepared to have this costume done. You can rehearse in it several times. You understand? Fix it, alter it, do whatever you have to do to it. But, you know, we want to have fun. You go out there to costume and it gives you all this trouble. Forget it. It can cost you a championship. It can cost you a placement. And it could cost you a lot of stress and headaches. So to avoid it, just rehearse in it. That's the best advice I can give you. And you know, um, talking about costumes and being prepared and stuff like that, let me take you back a few years. Well, I'm gonna take you back a few decades, okay? I think I was around 19 or 20 years old, and I was dancing at uh, something called the Dance Educators of America. It was an organization that every year they had like a conference kind of thing, and there was performances by guests and that year, they were excited to, to have a couple, like, you know, me and Sandra go there and uh, do a, uh, I think we did a three minute hustle routine and had tricks and all this stuff. And anyway, um, at that time, I thought I was all that, you know. So I had my seamstress, the person that was helping me. I don't know if it was a professional seamstress or not, but that person was helping me and get this costume done. And it was, uh, at that time, we were wearing what is referred to a cat suit. It was like all together stuff like that and I went out and it dawned on me that when I went out you know I had one of my favorite choreographers there with Bob Fosse and he was sitting at the table with several other choreographers um, so I was really excited I was young I thought I was gonna kill it and everything and I go out and the first move that I do in this routine is I jump up and I do what is called a scissor split where I go up and I kick my right leg and then I bring it back and I do a split well when I did that split my pants ripped from my waist in the back all the way to the crotch in the bottom. And then my buttocks was exposed to everyone in the ballroom for the next two and a half minutes. It was the most embarrassing moment of my life. And that was because I didn't get the costume beforehand, I didn't rehearse in it, okay? And was not prepared to go out there and perform in this outfit. I tell you that story because it was, it's horrendous for me to have to tell this story, but I think this will bring it home. Guys, Take your costumes, rehearse them, okay? And prepare properly before you go out and perform and compete. Okay, so this brings me to another subject about um, how often you should run your routine in front of people and where. Um, the strategy should be that you should get it in front of people as often as possible leading up to the competition you're gonna go to. You wanna be able to run this routine as many times as possible under the gun, what I refer to as under the gun, you know, performing it under the lights, audience, and see what the response is to the choreography itself. Because that's when you can make changes to it. You could do things to it, tweak it, once you've seen it in front of people. And get and take videos of it and, you know, just, just keep it, uh, evaluating your choreography that way. And if you have someone helping you with the choreography, that person should go with you, or you should have video and they should discuss it. You have a coach, discuss it with your coach. Whoever is on your team, make sure that they're in the process with you. So when you go out and perform it, at let's say a social, or perform it in the studio amongst the other students. Uh, sometimes you just want to go to any place, it doesn't matter, non-salsa, non-bachata, just so you can go out and see what an audience responds to it. Either way, it does two things really important. You'll get the runs necessary to gain more confidence and then you have ability to evaluate the choreography and make changes going leading up. But don't make those changes the day before a competition. I know people that do that, and some of them do okay, some of them don't do okay. That's a really risky thing, you don't wanna do that. So you have runs in front of an audience, like two months before, start that process. Okay, get, a, get enough runs, so that when you go to this competition, it feels comfortable. It's good to do the 7,500 runs without an audience, but there's nothing better than to actually take it and perform it in front of an audience. That will give you good feedback. So let's talk about the day of competition, like when you're actually there. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I, I get stressed out a little bit. It doesn't matter, you know, <laughs> that's just the way I am. I could be well rehearsed, um, feeling great, but I'm always gonna be nervous and I'm always gonna have a little stress. How I deal with that stress is I will go and check the timeline, see when my competition is scheduled to go on. 
So then I can go back and say to myself, I have X amount of hours, so let me take a nap. Let me do what necessary to prepare myself. That day, I don't run the routine. I actually don't want to run it. What I'll do is I'll check the floor maybe, during some breaks, put on my shoes, um, look at my partner. At the time, it was Sandra, and I'll look at Sandra and say, you know, let's do this. Or when it was Katie. I know Katie and me used to separate and concentrate individually and then come together. And because we competed in a different type of environment, we competed in ballroom. So in ballroom, they don't let you tech it, they don't let you run it. So we got used to just going there, handing the music, right? And basically just compete like that. So we had to be well rehearsed. But in the salsa scene or bachata scene, some of them that allow you to do tech, that's fine. At the World Salsa Summit, there's no such thing. But there is space where you can go and you have you could run it if you want to. My suggestion is there's no need, you're ready. If you need to warm up, warm up your body the way you need to have it and then go on. If you need to do a run, do it, but don't over rehearse. Don't get your body to the point where it's gonna get tired and you're not gonna perform at the highest level. You, know, you have to be able to gear your body towards that. I know that when I work with my couples, I'll have them run it really hard up to about three days before the competition. Then I tell them to take a day off. Don't do nothing, absolutely nothing. And that's so if you're competing Saturday, I'll have you do nothing on Friday, okay? And then Saturday, you can walk through some things, warm up properly, and do all the psychological things like I explained to you. Checking the timeline, you know, uh, making, checking my costume, making sure everything is fine with my costume, looking at my shoes. Maybe I put my shoes on, test the floor, because the floor might have changed, because of the climate in the room. Who knows? Um, I, I sometimes even go and make sure they have my music right, double check it just in case. Because I've had bad experiences, you know. I've made so many mistakes. That's why I'm here to tell you these tips, because I've made a lot of them. So, and and I let me. I just a story just came to me. You know, I I was um, competing for the very last time in Blackpool. I think this was 2003, and me and Katie were the current world cabaret champions, and we were doing a number called the Snake. So my coach came with us to Blackpool that this year because this was gonna be the last year that we competed. And he made me rehearse every single day leading up to the competition. Now, I respected my coach so much that I didn't wanna tell him I was tired. Physically, I was extremely tired. These routines were four and a half minutes long. And I remember that Wednesday, because the competition is on Thursday, that Wednesday, I think I ran it four times, and that's four and a half minutes, four times, we were like five overheads and I'm doing a split at the end where I'm carrying, I'm doing these ridiculously hard physical things. And I felt so tired and worn out. And I remember looking at Katie, I says, look, I'm really tired. And this was right before the competition. No one should walk into a situation like that. You should not put yourself in a situation where you're feeling tired before you go on. So don't let a coach, don't let an instructor, don't let a friend, don't let anyone tell you, you have to run this routine several times before you go on. Because let me tell you something, if you did what I tell you, rehearse it at home properly, a hundred times, you know this routine. You don't have to do it, you understand? You don't have to do it that same day. You can warm up properly and still have an excellent high level competition. Okay, so my suggestion, Listen to your body, okay? Talk to people around you that are supportive and make sure you put yourself in the right state of mind that Saturday. No need to have to feel like you have to run routines and over rehearse it before you go on. That work should be done prior to going to the competition. You know, and actually, um, checking the floor is something I do probably the very first few minutes that I get in the ball. The minute that I get to an event, when I was to compete, I would find out if the floor is free, who's on it, or do they have competitions on it. And when I find a space, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna check out what this floor feels like. I also take that opportunity to feel the room, who's there, I say hello, try to make myself feel comfortable in that scenario. You know, I would sometimes even take my partner, whether it be Katie or someone else, get on the floor, run our stuff, and act like I'm in a competition just so I can get the feel of the room, the lights, the floor, everything is important. You know, um, keeping the stress out, relaxing, even though we know you can't relax 
We know that. But, you know, give it a shot and try to... i always nervous. I'm nervous even now when I perform. It doesn't matter. Um, and I get nervous rehearsing in front of people. I think that's a natural thing. Um, I think that if you know that, then that's more reason for you to get out there with the rest of them and go through parts of your routine or through the whole routine. You're not going to disturb anybody because everyone's there for the same reason, to rehearse and prepare for the competition. Just don't over-rehearse. Know that you're going there just to feel the room. Imagine the judges there so you can psychologically prepare yourself, okay? Definitely do that. So I just want to take the opportunity now to discuss um, why I came back to competition at a late age. Um, if you don't know, um, I'm a recovering addict. I've been so for about 22 years now. I did heavy drugs and alcohol for a long period of time. I mean, I grew up in the Bronx when there was a lot of violence and drugs in the streets. Um, and when I got into my later years, around 38, 39 years old, I was getting out of a treatment facility and I, was, I didn't know exactly what I was gonna do. So I went out and got a job as a dance instructor somewhere because that's basically what, I, what I've been doing my whole life anyway is dance. I've been derailed by the drugs and alcohol, but dance has been the most consistent thing in my life. But I never really gave it 100% for some reason because I was too busy doing the other stuff, of the negative things that people get caught up. But it was 1998, and you know, and I, uh, I decided I was gonna go back to dance. Actually, that's not something I'm supposed to do because at the time everybody was telling me that, you know, that's just another means of you getting introduced again to drugs and alcohol all over again. You know, they say this thing about people, places, and things. Well, I had to find a way to dance. So I went into the studio and I started teaching, which was cool. Then I looked at television. I was looking at some of the competitions, ballroom competitions mainly, and I saw a category, you know, cabaret. And then I, I met Katie, we discussed it, and then I asked her if, I, if she was interested in competing. Why is that important? What it actually did was gave me focus, and it gave me a goal. And I kept training, and at an age where most people are retiring, you know, I decided I'm gonna go on this journey to compete. Most of the judges, well, my friends that I knew from the 70s are judging me now, and I'm in my 40s, 41, 42, you know. But I would never change that experience because that what enables me to stay focused, stay clean, stay on a path, productive. I was a, a, a productive person in society now, and it all happened because it was competition dancing. And I wanted to make sure that the salsa and bachata scene has that. I dedicated the better part of the last 20 years to establishing rules and regulations and making sure the competition is fair and having well-defined competitions and allowing youngsters to, to, to not have to go down that path of drugs and alcohol. You know, we have some of the best dancers in the world right now and I will put them up against any other dance discipline. When you get a Karen and Ricardo, Karina and Raphael, and I can just name endless amount of couples that you can put them in mainstream TV, you can put them anywhere and they'll match up with any other expert in any other dance field. That's what competition can do. And that's why I feel the need to educate as many people as possible. So I hope you enjoyed this, this, these tips and how I define competition. I hope it's helpful for you. Guess what? We're at the end. But if you wanna dive deeper, you could always stay connected. Just go to this link down here. Okay, stay connected. I will absolutely answer any question you have. And I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank G. Franco and their team to giving me this opportunity. See you in the dance floor.